Hello and welcome to Ticket Manager's All Access Interview Series, engaging leaders from across the sports marketing spectrum to identify and explore critical issues in the business of sports, entertainment, sponsorship, activation, ticketing, hospitality, and even more. I'm your host, Jim Andrews, and joining me on this episode is Rob Prasmark, founder and CEO of 21 Sports and Entertainment Marketing Group, better known as 21 Marketing. Now, Rob has represented properties from the Olympic Games to FIFA's World Cup to Jerry Jones and the Dallas Cowboys, as well as the Smithsonian, NASA, and, and many others, raising over $3.8 billion for his clients. He is truly the godfather of sports partnerships and sponsorship sales. And he's also the author of the new book, The Olympics Don't Take American Express, The Birth of Mega Sports Sponsorships, Part One. And we'll talk about that, uh, why it's part one in just a minute. But Rob, you know, in the words of the immortal Peaches and Herb, reunited and it feels so good. Great to see you. Uh, Jim, great to see you. I mean, we had a great uh, a past in history and, and through those IEG days. And uh, it actually, those IEG days, for those of your listeners and viewers that, that remember them, really gave me the platform to do the career. So I really thank you and Lisa and Lauren and everybody involved with the old IEG conferences. Uh, that's great. And, and I still have people remember those those presentations and come up to me and say, oh, yeah, I, I was inspired by Rob to uh, to, to do, do things differently and, and think outside the box. And, and he helped me with, with my career. So, yeah, yeah, mutually beneficial for sure. There's so much we, we can talk about. There's so much in the book. You know, I was just fascinated reading it and you know, reminded of, of certain things that I had forgotten you know, back in the day. But but I really want to start off with 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 a question based on the book's title. You know, the Olympics don't take American Express. And that's probably, to me, the supreme example of category exclusivity. It's a topic that has come up on, on numerous episodes of this podcast. And, you know, for years, exclusivity was a defining pillar of, of sports and entertainment partnerships. And I, I, there are certainly still some categories like payment systems where sharing or splitting the category between comp competitors is, is, is not going to happen. But we've seen many other examples recently where, where properties are selling non-exclusive uh, deals. So you know, I, I got to turn to you as the guy who literally wrote many of the rules around exclusivity, you know, and I say literally in the in the contracts in those early days. And what do you think about that that change that that you know you you now see competitors like an Anheuser Busch and 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 Miller Coors being willing to to split categories? Did, did you foresee that ever ever happening? I never did, Jim. You know, we, when we created the Olympic program, which really stood for uh, top, right. and we used to call it the Olympic problem uh, <laughs> because we couldn't find anybody to sponsor the thing. Back in the day, it really was taking what Peter Ubroth did in the 1984 Olympic Games and taking that to a different level or taking that to a global idea where Ubroth's idea was just uh, in, uh, in America for the 1984 Olympic Games. So many things we had to do that to create leverage of getting the monies that the Olympic folks needed to keep the uh, Olympic movement alive. I mean, they we tend to forget that they were on the verge of bankruptcy coming out of the 1984 Olympic Games. And, you know, you, you talk about 84 <clears throat> and Ubroth raising all this money, but the money stayed in America. Right. The money stayed either in Los Angeles for the Sports Council, I think it was called at the time, right. uh, or went to uh, the USOC and the Olympic Trust. So the IOC really didn't make much money off that. And I remember when I got hired by the IOC to sell the, the Olympic problem, I think they had $3 million in the bank. I mean, oh, that was God. it. And, and the, the whole program was created because they were concerned their chief source of revenue was coming out of broadcasting. And they thought if if uh, broadcasters uh, uh, ever colluded and did joint bidding and drove down, I mean, you wouldn't have the Paris games the way we have uh, coming up uh, by NBC. So that's the, that's the, the, the quick answer. Times have changed. I still love the concept of exclusivity because it, it's a differentiator. 
But the demand of these properties for big time money, only to raise their goals and to achieve them, they have to split categories. I'm I am a little amazed that the corporate marketplace has agreed to that. I mean, two beers or two airlines and whatever, but it is what it is. And it's really associating no longer with the event, although those have, you know, uh, advantages, you know, the ticketing and the signage and all that kind of stuff, but really with the platform of the event. Exclusivity could move into not just category, but a platform. Environment could be a platform, right? World peace could be a platform. I mean, I mean, all this kind of stuff. So we're moving into a different direction, and it's a very cluttered environment. But if you miss out on some of these opportunities, if you're on the corporate side, you know, you could be paying the price uh, later on. So I'm a little ambivalent. It's kind of like if you're a property, you want the chicken or you want the fish. Do, do you do you do you want to go all in exclusive with exclusivity or split the category? And you know the marketplace is changing, but the the demands for revenue for these properties are big. And that's I mean it goes to show the the demand, right? So absolutely the the power of of sponsorship that uh, that that you know competitors are are willing to split or. In the case of the Olympics, still that they're willing to pay that premium price for for the exclusive opportunity. But it, yeah, it's fascinating. I think some of the, those are some of the most fascinating discussions I've ever been a part of. Is with an organization trying to figure out, as you say, which do you want, the chicken or the fish? Because neither neither is a bad choice. They're just it's going to take you down down a couple of different paths and 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 mean you're going to have to interact with your with your partners in different ways. But. But yeah, it's, it's a fascinating discussion. Yeah, and, and I'm going to come back to the fact that the uh, rising need of of organizing committees or events to raise big money, and you know, with the fragmentation of the sponsorship marketplace, it's a tough dilemma to be in. You know, I was happy I only had one road to go. You know, it's kind of like the Yoga Yogi Berra quote: "If you come to the fork in the road, take it." You know, and and and. <laughs> And uh, uh, so it's fascinating. I would always tell a property, you got to go out with uh, exclusive category first. And if you're finding eh, it could be kind of tough, maybe you can always go to plan B or take the other fork in the road. And and so that's what I would advise, uh, you know, an average property. You mentioned big dollars and, and, and I talked about the, you know, the, the billions of dollars that, that you raised for on behalf of your clients. And as I mentioned, that's, you know, just kind of inspirational, I think, to anybody, even even the folks who are selling, you know, $50,000, $100,000 partnership uh, packages. I would argue that one of the keys to, to your success, and, and there are many of them, but especially early on when you were selling at that point as you said, a, a brand new property uh, in, in top, was the amount of research that you did into understanding a company's business. And I remember you sharing some of those, you know, the background on, on some of those, uh, the prospecting and, and, and the research that you did. You know, you would go into, you know, really understanding how the, not just the products, but how the company went to market, you know, the internal uh, workings of it and, 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 and all of that. And, and ultimately how it could use a partnership to make money. Is that basically a correct assumption? Was that, do you think that was a key huge. success factor for you? Huge. And it really came out of, before I got into the sponsorship world, I, I worked for ABC and then before that NBC. And it was all about the research. It was all about the demographics. It was all about targeted marketing. And so I took that mentality into the uh, sponsorship space uh, with the Olympic space. And they had no research, or maybe they had one page of research. So I would go to them and go, we need more research. I mean, I mean, I don't care what people think of, I, I do care what people think of the rings, but, but what else can you do? Because when we would go in to pitch a company, what is the company's strategy and the tactics that they're using and how do we match into that? And that was the deer in headlight look I got from the people that I reported to was amazing, but they gave me the funding to do the research. And that was the most important thing. I know in the book, I get into the Jerry Jones stuff and you know he came to me, he came to me 
And he says, Robert, Robert, he has to call me Robert. I don't know why. <laughs> Robert, Robert, we're America's team. And I go, how do you know you're America's team? <laughs> it's not, you it's said, true. I just feel like I can do a good Jerry imitation. I just, <laughs> and I go, well, when you just can't feel it and sell it for the money we're asking for. And he gave me the money to do research that proved that he was America's team. He was not maybe the number one team in Atlanta, but he was the number two team in Atlanta. Uh, he was not the number one team in Chicago. He was the number two team in Chicago. But he had this huge base, especially in, in Texas. And, and this is before the Texans were there and whatever. And he was far and away America's team. I mean, you went into markets, again, before the Ravens in Baltimore and the skins. This He was number two in Washington, D.C. So you accumulated all that data. And we went in and said, you're sponsoring, uh, in those days, Texas Stadium, but you were sponsoring America's team. We never could have sold that without <laughs> Jerry. I don't forget to look. How much do you want for, re for research? I just feel it, Robert. Jerry, it's great that you feel it, but we got to prove it. On the Olympic front, you know, I think I told you this story uh, before we did this podcast, but there are times I would tell the my team, I go, I need this piece of research. You've got to go find it for me. And this is pre-internet days. But, you know, when we would stand up and ask for, in those days, a lot of money, $10 million, $15 million for global rights, we had to show the company that the brands, uh, the demographics aligned with the Olympic brand or the FIFA World Cup brand or some of the other properties that we had along. And it was the, it was the key thing because, you know, just selling, you know, uh, it, we, we were in a transition period, Jim, where CEOs would say, I think that feels right. Let's buy that. Well, those days were changing back then. And so we had to come up for a reason for the board of directors of Kodak, remember the Kodak, would oh, say, yes, yes, this is important. Look at the research that they're doing. We had 3M as an, an initial a top partner sponsor, and they glommed on to the research we presented about the Olympic brand and why it was good for employee morale, their customers, all that kind of stuff. And you know, they are a, a technical company. I mean, they, they're a research-driven company. And if I didn't have that research, I never would have got 3M. I mean, never. I mean, and, you know, they were around for, I think, two uh, two quad quadrennial periods. I'm sorry to belabor the point, but no, no. Re research, 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 the three R's. Absolutely. And 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 extended to the, the business to business end of things, too, which I always thought was interesting. I, you know, I... You, at least for me, I, you know, my first thought when I think sponsorship and I think about these big brands is, you know, the consumer branding, you know, the, the Coca-Colas and, and and those and you know, putting the rings on cans and merchandise and all of that. But but, you know, the demonstration of some of those partners, you mentioned 3M, Bausch and Lomb, John Hancock, of just literally being able to use the Olympics as an incentive for for their for their salespeople, for 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 distributors, and all of that kind of stuff. That really kind of blew me away at how how valuable it was, just on on the B two B level alone. Oh, you're right. And and what I would do is drill. And it's just on me. Well, you know, we had a team of people, but we would drill into how the company sold their products. Exactly. And it's not always the consumer <clears throat> walking down the supermarket uh, aisle looking for something with Olympic rings. It was how do you create incentives <clears throat> for the salespeople who are selling to the supermarket? Right. Or in, you bring up John Hancock, which will be in part two but of the book, but a guy named David Alessandro. I mean, he was all about the salespeople and how do you ignite your traditional insurance salesperson who goes to a president's club every year because he's phoning it in and, and he or she's phoning it in and they have this base of renewals and, you know, they just... 
you know, whatever. He got into thinking the Olympics would be a once in a lifetime thing for his salespeople to go to because it's not another trip to Hawaii. It was another trip to Puerto Rico. He's going to Albert for France or he's going to Barcelona. He or she's going to Barcelona. And it was amazing. He taught me that the spouses drove a lot of the decision making in inspiring the employed spouse to light the fire within and as a catalyst because he or she, the spouse, wanted to go to Barcelona or wanted to go to the Olympic Games. And he didn't really care about, he cared about the rings. Uh, and they put rings on business cards and, you know, all that kind of stuff uh, the old way. We, now we have signatures on our emails. But it, it really is about generating incremental revenue. What he did was if the previous year's President's Club, you had to sell, I don't know, I'll make this number up, $100 million worth of life insurance. And if you did, you would go to Hawaii, okay? He raised that bar to $120 million, and he he got more people to raise over $120 million because the award was the Olympic Games. And he did a whole, he, I remember the spreadsheets. I remember we had spreadsheets. And and he says, this thing pays for itself. I mean, I don't need to do anything, even when he throws in first class hospitality. I remember in the Bosch Alam thing, Bosch Alam, much bigger company back in the day. You know, they were into contacts and they had Ray-Ban and others. And they're a bunch of basically ophthalmologists running the company. And I had to prove that being associated with the Olympics and the programs we could create would uh, create a different image in the minds of the people that they were selling to at the doctor's office. And now you couldn't you couldn't award a doctor a trip to the games. I mean that's that's illegal, or they frowned upon that. But it was an image thing that they had. So. We had the famous plumbing chart that that tied all of this stuff together. That sales cycle for Abash Alam, uh, um, they're a shadow of a company that they were back in the day. That sales cycle took 22 months wow. to conclude that. Sure. And there was, I mean, they're, they're doctors, they're ophthalmologists. I mean, they needed, they needed research. Going back to your original question, they needed research. Yeah, and, and I'm, I'm glad you mentioned part two, and, and I, I want to get back to that a little later on. But but one of the things in, in part one, and, and certainly something I'm familiar with, having known you for a long time, is you know, you, the representation of the Olympics and the Cowboys are, are certainly the headlines of, of your career. But you, you made a, a, a pivot, uh, you talk about in the book, and, and started representing non-sports properties, the Smithsonian, uh, for for sure, and, and, and others. And you know, I I just love to hear from you. What are some of the key differences when you're you're pitching a, a seven or an eight figure deal with a non sports event versus a, a sports property, or or maybe it was all the same to you? I don't know. I, I can't believe I'm saying this now, but I got into what I call intellectual marketing versus mm -hmm. sports marketing because I was bored with sports marketing. And and so when Smithsonian came around and I knew they were coming up to their 150th anniversary, I came up with an idea to 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 celebrate their 150th anniversary. And I loved it because, you know, when you knocked on a door and it's really more true today than it is back then when you knock. On a door, I mean, how many sports proper? There's a lot of clutter out there, but you walk in the door, especially, you know, you try to go way up on a sea level with something different <clears throat> that can appeal to different level of their customers, their board members, their shareholders. People tend to forget a lot of this is about their shareholders. I always got a meeting. They're pretty much, I didn't get always, but pretty much got a meeting. And I just did, or we just did, just take the principles of Olympic marketing, FIFA marketing, NFL marketing, <clears throat> and spin that into non-traditional intellectual marketing. 
Same things apply. I mean, the signage, the brand association is very key. And we had a big brand association with Smithsonian and ticketing, you know, all that kind of stuff is an easy transition. Government relations is another big one that people okay. tend to forget. Investor, government relations. And the intellectual piece of this really appeal to people in D.C. because of government relations. One of the most fun projects I ever worked on is I, I got, I don't know how I did it, but I got a hold of NASA, you know, the space agency. And they were looking for sponsorship for funding down at the Kennedy Space Center Visitor Complex. Okay, yep. And they wanted companies to come in to help build out exhibitions. And as much as you may think about NASA, Man, they are, they're crazy. I mean, uh, they, they're something out of Star Wars and Star Trek. I mean, they're a blend. And one of the projects they were looking for was funding because NASA believes in time travel. We get a hold of, of, of Omega Swiss timing and they put together a team of people that come to the Kennedy Space Center. And I don't know if you've ever been there, but um, the Kennedy Space Center has a thing, a Saturn V exhibit, which is the most powerful rocket and took our guys to, to the moon. Yeah. So uh, we had a great association with an astronaut by the name of Gene Cernan. He's the last man to walk on the moon. And while we had Aldrin and some of the other moonwalkers, they to me were the true heroes. I mean, you could dunk a basketball, hit a golf ball. The, I can say men, these men, were crazy. I mean, they risked their lives to go and they were superstars and they never commercialized themselves. Uh, all of them to a little degree, but they they really didn't commercial. But I was in awe of it. So one day I'm walking around with Cernan. We've got the Swiss contingency <clears throat> and he's explaining the Saturn V rocket because he was on Apollo 17 and Apollo 18 was ready to go and uh, the government canceled the program. What, what do you do with a, a rocket this big? So what they do is they unfuel it, <clears throat> they put it on its side and it's a big exhibition. So we're walking around and <clears throat> started saying about this stage and this stage and this stage and somehow Gene and I get separated from the, the group. And so I got to go, Gene, I've known you for a while. You know, I, I got to ask you, if they can take that rocket back out to, I think, launch pad 39A or B, fuel it up, would you get back on that rocket and go back to the moon? And he looked at me and said, are you kidding me? No fucking way. Sorry, <laughs> F word. He said, that thing is a, an atomic bomb with seats on it. <laughs> and uh, those guys risked their lives, you know, um, you know, uh, to do that. Those guys were real, real heroes. And as much as I wanted to commercialize the, the astronaut program, the moonwalkers, I mean, they, they would, Gene would talk about it like, you know, you were his co-pilot. I mean, he was absolutely terrific. They were, that was a missed opportunity. And unfortunately, Gene has passed. So that's, he told me I could never tell that story until he died. Uh, <laughs> so now I feel free. I can tell the story. Exactly. The thing there too, is when, when you're talking about something like that, it, it's it's so unique. It could be so powerful to to commercialize that. And whether it's you know, with Omega or, 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 or another company, but to me, those kinds of opportunities, they're a double-edged sword, right? It, could be the biggest thing ever, but you've got to find a company that gets it because it's not playing it safe to to to, to be the pioneer and, and be the first company to do that. It's a lot easier to buy a package of, from a from a sports event that's been around for for decades. Did you, did you face that? Is that is that a, a fair a fair statement to make? You're right, and it kind of goes back to the. I don't want to keep on going back to the book, but the title of the book, "The Olympics Don't Take American Express," because. American Express was a logical choice. They were they were the Google of its day. And we could never get traction with them. And they knew that they were at the top of the heap. And, and they why? 
At one point, management told me the Olympics need us more than we need the Olympics. And so, you know, I was young and you know, naive and stupid and arrogant. And, and I said, well, I'm going to sell it to somebody else. And I'll never forget the comment that, you know, uh, someone made to me, go ahead, who are you going to sell it to? Visa, that ragtag group of banks, they can't agree to what to have for lunch. Okay. And so I went, yeah, I'll sell it to Visa. So, so I forgot where you're going with the question, but, but <laughs> uh, the, I always, there were, I'm sorry, I know where they were, but there were two people inside of Visa, Jan Soderstrom and John Bennett, who had the vision. They were trying to make their mark and they were not afraid to make the gamble. And so I, even to this day, look for someone who isn't phoning it in, okay, isn't worried about their pension, isn't a retirement fund. They want to make a difference in, in the marketplace. And and that a champion, you know, I guess, is, is what I'm looking for. So, but the unique, going back to your original question, Jim, the uniqueness of Smithsonian, NASA, we have the 250th anniversary of America coming up in, in 2026. Uh, that's that's another story. And and but how do you how do you take something as big as America, 250 years, and say yes, I believe in America, and we're going to rally behind programs and social discourse, you know, things like that. So. I think it's it's more fun today than it was, you know, 20, 30 years ago. All right. You mentioned John Bennett, and that that leads me to a question that I don't think I've ever asked you directly, either on stage at an IEG conference or in any kind of personal conversation. So uh, new, new territory here. I'd love to hear your honest opinion of, of ambush marketing. And I'll preface that by saying I've always been of the opinion that a brand that creatively establishes a, a an unofficial association with a tentpole event like the Olympics or the World Cup, as long as they're not violating anyone's IP, I say that's that's smart smart marketing. Others, including John, would say it's it's unethical, it, it's harmful uh, to the rights holders. Where do you, Rob Prasmark, stand on on that issue? Well, John came up with a great line. It was not ambush marketing <clears throat> because people thought ambush marketing marketing was a good thing, a clever thing. He called it parasitic marketing. That's, I remember that. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the, the Olympics may be a little different from uh, the NFL or some of the other things right. because the hand on heart is that the, especially in this country, the only revenue that they have is coming out of, of commercial revenue or um, gift giving and, and maybe some licensing. They don't get governmental funding. Right. Uh, and so that was the, the thing that drove me nuts back in the day, ambush marketing. But in today's environment, where broadcasters are paying so much money and broadcasters actually fuel these programs more so than sponsorship. Sponsorship uh, does some promotion and you know all that kind of stuff, but and sponsors sometimes buy airtime or media time. I can't call it airtime, media time, which really fuels the decision of the media company to renew and pay more for the rights. However, but sponsors don't buy all the time, so right. you got to go to the dare I say the anti-sponsor for right. revenue. And if you're going to, if you're, well, they don't have anybody uh, in quick service anymore, but, but when you had McDonald's, you had Subway and you had Wendy's, uh, uh, you know, creating programs that made you think that they were a, a sponsor. And so I don't have an answer for you, Jim. I mean, <laughs> sorry. Um, it's okay. I get the reason why ambush marketing is bad or parasitic marketing is bad. Uh, but I also realize that there's a huge engine that that, uh, that is fueled by broadcasters and selling media time that needs to be funded if the broadcasters <clears throat> will pay the rights owners the monies and that fuels their engine. You know, with Paris coming up, I haven't felt that there's a, a 
ambush, super ambush out there. Uh, they'll run their classic commercials. You know, you've got Allianz, who's an insurance sponsor right. for the IOC, the, uh, the official dumb. I don't think they'll buy much airtime on NBC. So they need NBC needs to go to Geico and and Progressive and other, but uh, and they'll do they'll do like minded ads. But I will tell you that they don't want to be perceived later. They don't want to be perceived as ambushing a call the company a, a cause. So I think back in the day, the Olympic folk did a great job of uh, when the Olympics were about to be broadcast. They would send a, a, they would carpet bomb a, a CEOs of the a competitive company right. and said, "Look, don't ambush us because you're going to hurt us." And we, they never did, but we'll create a campaign to embarrass you. That was enough at a C level, kind of go well. Why do we want to risk that? The, the yeah, exactly. PR, uh, on all that. So that's my long answer to a short question. <laughs> no, it's uh, it, it's a good and, and and fair answer, and it it, it reminds me of, of one of my favorite IEG sessions where I don't know how we did this, but we convinced John Bennett from Visa and Jerry Welsh from American Express wow. to get together. Wow! Uh, and, and have that debate, and I'll never forget that John. From behind the podium, I didn't see him bring this up, but from behind the podium, all of a sudden held up a Bible and said, it says in here, thou shalt not steal. <laughs> and Jerry, Jerry turned and looked at him and said, I thought we were in business, not in church. But, uh, <laughs> and they, they went on from there. And, and, and both of them had, had very good points. And, and it was a great session. Yeah, I mean, Jerry was an innovator. He it's in the book. And I'm sorry for promoting that. But. Uh, it's in the book when American Express basically threw me out the window and said, don't come back here, kid. They had given me the blueprint of if they were to do it, what we would do with it. So pause related marketing. Uh, and this is one of my uh, this is a, an original marks on cards. I, <laughs> I love it. <laughs> uh, first affinity card. I just took their if we do this, this is our terms. And I just, you know, in those days, you didn't have computers for searching, but but I would white out American Express and put Visa in there, and Visa in there. And so Jerry taught me, Jerry's the reason we have Visa today, because he basically threw me out the window. He was extremely creative, is cr extremely creative. And who knows if the top program would have been su as success successful as it is today if American Express had said yes. Yeah, interesting. Um, you know, because it really created a um created an avalanche, avalanche of 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 uh, others who said, wow, if a number two brand or number three brand like Visa can take on American Express to become the number one brand using the Olympics, maybe we could do the same. I want to ask about, about part two, and, and, and maybe I'll ask it this way. And, and I'm glad you mentioned Hancock and David D'Alessandro, because uh, I, I looked for his name in the, in the index of your book and didn't see it. And I was like, how could that be? But now I understand that you, know, you couldn't, you can't get everything in, in just this one volume. You got so much in there already. So, so maybe the question is, What's the what's the best story you left out of the book, and and, and what should we uh, maybe anticipate if there is a part two someday? I get asked this question all the time, and then also why is there a, no chapter on Casey Wasserman? That's the other one. The best story I thought was I was representing FIFA World Cup in America, and we had uh, PPG, which was the paint company and the plastic and glass company, and they understood the globalness. Of the World Cup, the problem is selling World Cup in for 1994 is you know, uh, uh, American decision makers didn't understand the magnitude of this thing. PPG did. So Michael Provenzano, it, it was my guy, and he's a corporate, and he goes, uh, "Rob, I got good news and bad news." And and I said, "Okay, give it to me." He says, "The good news is we're going to do this, and we're going to pay you." what you want. I, I think in those days, it was like five million bucks. And I said, well, <laughs> what's the bad news? He says, <laughs> we don't have any money. And I go, well, <laughs> that's a big thing. That's a problem. Says, but yeah. what we do is we have paint. 
So we would like to trade, and I'm sure you got a lot of painting needs and and whatever, five million dollars in in barter or of value in kind. And I'm thinking, okay, that's not bad. He says, well, it gets worse than that. And, and I go, how can it get worse than that? He says, well, <laughs> we only have, we have an excess run of beige paint. <laughs> and, and I'm going, beige paint. So as an agent, you have to put all of your, your deals in front of your client. Right. And so I get a whole Alan Rothenberg, who is, who's chairman of, of World Cup, and Randy Bernstein was working for him at the time. And I said, look, I, I went to, to the good news and bad news and the whole thing. And the look on Alan Rothenberg's face was incredible. And <laughs> I, I think Randy's jaw dropped. And, and he goes, Rob, we could use three to $5 million with a red, white, and blue paint. Right. right? Or even green paint, but beige <laughs> paint. So Randy goes, well... I'll tell you what we need is we need telephones. And in those days, the press centers, I think there are nine or 12 venues, were old fashioned phones and you plugged your computer into and that's how you use your, we need $5 million worth of, of, of phones. You turn the paint in the phones, you got a deal. So I'm thinking, how the heck? So uh, again, I'm trying to shorten the story. I came out of broadcast, so I understood the world of barter. Yeah. And so I got a hold of this barter company who said, sure, we will take on the paint and we will turn that into a credit for uh, telephones. And then along, you know, along the way, the guy who's doing the deal, this guy named Tom Tansky, uh, I'll never forget, he's doing the deal to put all this stuff together and I just need his signature and and he's not returning my call. And, and so I give his assistant, remember we had assistants in those days, a call and I said, I need to talk to uh, Tom, Tom Tansky. And there's like dead silence. And I go, oh, what's the issue? And, oh, Mr. Prosmark, you haven't heard, but Tom died. Oh, and of course, what happens is your brain goes in two different directions. One is... Oh, I'm so sorry for the family. I mean, oh my God. The other half goes, well, who's making the decision? What about my team? Sign this thing. Sign this thing. Well, anyway, a, a long, a very, again, a long story. That'll be in the book. And and Tom, great guy, passed. Uh, and we did the deal and, and everything. And people say, well, did you get paid in telephones or did you get paid in pa paint? <laughs> I got paid in cash. So. There you go. You know, Rob, reading the book, it's clear you've seen kind of the best and the worst of, of the sports marketing business, the highs and the lows, if you will. At the end of the day, if, if a young person in, in your life came to you and asked for advice on whether they should en enter into the business of, of buying and selling sports partnerships, what do you what do you advise them? Do you say, go ahead and, and do it or, or maybe look at other options? First, I'd say go look at Wall Street. Uh, <laughs> But but uh, uh, two is the opportunity is so vast. You have maybe 300, 400 in America, sports teams and franchises and stuff, and you've got so many media outlets. I would go for it. It was different in our day, my day, because it, IMG was the only thing that was out there and maybe uh, ProServe and, and uh, Advantage. But I'll never forget my father. I was in college. And he goes, well, what are you going to do? And and uh, and I'm thinking, I don't know. And and he goes, well, I want you to think differently. And that eventually became an apple. apple uh, exactly. yeah. He says, think big. You need to create something that differentiates yourself from everything else. He says, you want to be the next Tom Watson. And I'm going, Tom Watson, IBM, the guy who founded IBM. He goes, yeah, I want, you want to be him. Sure, I want to be here. <laughs> that's stuck in my head to think big or go home. Think differently. Tony Pontero, who we know from AB, he wrote a book called The Revenge of the C-plus Student. And in there, he's got a chapter where he talks about every once in a while, you have to throw at the moose. And if you remember Bull Durham, the movie, right, yeah. uh, the picture there, which I think was played by Timothy Robbins, 
had control issues and every once in a while he would hit the mascot, which was a moose, and scare the daylights out of uh, the batters. Yeah, um, and it, when I almost got fired a number of times, but but when I was at NBC and especially ABC, I would think differently and think big and out of the box. And I almost got fired like three or four times, but but I I made a a, a, a difference and a and a change. So the answer is yes, but don't be, if you're a man or a woman, think big, think bigger, or go home yeah, and think great. differently and speak up because you're not there just to collect a paycheck. You're there about your career and you're there about making a difference. And remember always, you are your own brand. Great advice. I, I'm glad we, we talked about that because I think that's, that's, Excellent, excellent advice for for anyone, no matter where they are uh, in, in their careers. So, Rob, thanks again. Wish you all the best, and we'll talk to you soon. Thanks, Jim. And on behalf of Ticket Manager, I want to thank all of you for listening and watching, and remind you to please join us again for the next episode in the All Access Interview Series.